Welcome back to Brazil Crypto Report. Today, I'm joined by Thomas Bunner, CEO of Credix, which is a decentralized credit marketplace built on Solana. We talk about how Credix has enabled more than 10,000 small borrowers in Latin America to take out $40 million worth of loans, and how the company is doubling down on the Brazil market to expand its loan portfolio. All right. So we are here today with Thomas Bunner, who's the CEO of Credix. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to be here. Amazing. Well, to get started, why don't you give us a quick introduction to yourself and Credix? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I'm calling here from uh, Credix's Antwerp uh, office headquarters. Um, I'm the CEO and uh, founder of Credix. My background has always been in financial services. After a short stint in banking, I decided that I thought uh, the future of finance was not going to be spreadsheets, but it was going to be about technology. Um, I got involved into the world of crypto, the world of blockchain, um, was very inspired by how it could transform the potential for payments, post-trade, clearing, settlement, credit. And that experience really brought me to starting credits. And so with Credix, we have built a blockchain-based platform for tokenization that connects institutional investors globally, being it asset managers, hedge funds, family offices from all over the world. And we connect them with private credit opportunities in emerging markets. And specifically, we with Credix were focused on Latin America and very active uh, in Brazil. Amazing, amazing. And uh, well, about 15 months ago, in August of 2022, I had uh, your CTO, Maxime Pison on the show. And we did kind of a deep dive into how the platform works and how some of the tranches are structured and the loans, loans are packaged and everything like that. Uh, we went pretty deep into the um, just sort of the, the nuts and bolts of how the whole thing works. It, it was super interesting. It's actually my most downloaded episode ever. So uh, clearly, there's some interest in what you guys are doing. So uh, so that was really interesting. And it's great to connect with you, Thomas, to kind of get, I guess, you know, maybe a bit more on the kind of the you're a bit more on like as a CEO, you're a bit more on kind of the business and the corporate side of things. Um, and also just to kind of get an update on what you guys have been doing the last 15 months, because I feel like, uh, you know, every time I like turn around, there's some new you know press release you guys have out or some new partnership or something. So you guys have really been uh, you're just about two years old now, but you're really hustling and you're really delivering a lot, which is super cool. So. Um, um, but for folks who want to get kind of a deeper understanding of the credits platform itself, I would refer you to this episode I did with Maxime, uh, from, uh, August of last year. And I'll, I'll post a link to that in the notes here. Um, but to get us started, maybe Thomas, maybe just give us a bit of an overview of like, what have you guys been doing kind of the last 15 months? Like what's been kind of the highlights, what's been, you know, it seems like you guys are really firing at all cylinders here, but maybe give us an overview and then we can dive into some of the specifics. Most definitely. So, uh, so yeah, indeed, uh, fun fact is, so this week, uh, it was Credit's uh, second anniversary. So we're now a, a 24 month old company. Um, I most definitely remember that, uh, that amazing episode that you did with Max, uh, going really deep into how the smart contracts work, how the tokenization work, how the technology works. And I think that also very, very much aligned with like how we have been focusing on this, right? So initially when we launched the company, we raised some capital, we invested a lot in product, product experience, building the core infrastructure, the smart contracts, the settlement layer. And really over the last 15 months, we have been putting that in practice, right? So we have been originating assets on the platform. So in the last 15 months alone, we deployed um, more than $45 million worth of capital into consumer and SME loans in Colombia, in Mexico, and most definitely strong focus on Brazil, very strong growth in Brazil. And we have been doing that by partnering up with a bunch of institutional investors, onboarding them on the platform and improving also for them the user experience. And so from a product side uh, there, we have definitely focused a lot on blockchain abstraction, 
institutionalization of the product, a lot around data availability, real-time reporting, real-time monitoring capabilities, um, working very closely together with both the borrowers and the investors on the platform, directly getting feedback from them and incorporating that. Um, and so we're super excited uh, about what's next. And I know you have some news that you just dropped earlier this week, uh, or at least by the time this episode is released, it will the news will have dropped. But why don't you tell us a bit about what this means and what, what the news is? Most definitely, most definitely. So for, for credits to, to grow and scale, it is vital for us to have access to capital. And so we just um, announced that we raised a $60 million credit facility with a large credit asset manager out of the United States. Now, what does this mean for credits? This means we have access to a warehouse facility, a credit warehouse facility. So this money, this capital will be used to provide financing to SMEs, to consumers in the Latin American market through the Credix platform. Credix will act here as an underwriter and a sourcing uh, engine for those assets. And our technology and our tokenization engine will be used to distribute the capital and to give the investor a very clear, transparent, real-time overview of its portfolio. Amazing, amazing. Well, congratulations on that. That's definitely uh, a pretty significant achievement. And maybe just kind of give us a an overview of what does your, you know, you, you guys kind of have this marketplace of you have investors uh, kind of from the global north and your your you know network of of borrowers in the in kind of the global south, so to speak, if we're going to use that language. And your borrowers are not necessarily, I think this is kind of an important distinction. The borrowers aren't necessarily like retail people that are like taking out loans, but it's it's like the actual non-bank lenders, these fintechs in these countries like a Brazil or a Colombia who are accessing this capital. And then they're the ones who are able to make those loans to the retail people. So the retail folks don't even necessarily know that they're interacting with, uh, you know, a decentralized blockchain credit marketplace. Um, but maybe, could you maybe give us just some numbers on, you know, maybe, you know, um, like how many, how many, how many of these folks on the demand side on the, on the, on the loan side, are you, do you have on the platform now? Like what's kind of the, the total like loan portfolio or, or any kind of numbers that can help us just better understand, uh, you know, the scope of this platform two years in? Oh yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. So, um, today we have, uh, 40 million us dollars in loans outstanding. So in assets under management, um, in the, in the world of DeFi and crypto, very often referred to as the total value locked in the, in the smart contracts. Um, and so with the additional 60 million from this investor, we will scale our assets under management above that, uh, very important number of a hundred million, uh, us dollars. Now, we have done that by indeed partnering up locally with origination platforms. Today, we have 10 of those tech enabled of those financial technology platforms as origination and distribution partners of the credits. Just to give you an example, um, the most recent transaction that we did was a transaction with a platform called Credime. Um, and Credime is doing invoice receivable financing. So one of the very big problems in this market is that SMEs, uh, small and medium enterprises, don't have access to the traditional banking system. And so getting access to working capital, optimizing their cash flows is, is really hard. But also these SMEs are really small companies. And so it's also very hard to underwrite them. And so that is why we specifically partnered up with this partner, Credit May, who's really focused on underwriting those SMEs. But Credit May, of course, needs capital to provide to those SMEs. And so that is really a marriage made in heaven, right? Because Credit May can come to the Credits platform in a digital native experience, get easy, fast, and flexible access to capital to then lend out to the SMEs. And so indirectly, um, we have financed over uh, 10,000 SMEs and individuals uh, on the Credix platform. Wow. And this is predominantly in, in Brazil, correct? With, with some, with some uh, borrowers also in, in Mexico and Colombia? 
Yes, yeah, so so we have some borrowers in in Mexico and Colombia, um, and then our focus is really the Brazilian market. The Brazilian market is a special beast by itself. It is this two hundred forty million people market. Um, it's pretty remote. Um, they have a very strong growing GDP, um, but they have a heavily concentrated banking network. Only the top five banks, um, they, they serve like 90% of the customers um, and they have been doing that for ages. And that means that there is not a lot of competition. There is not a lot of need for them to innovate, to build technology, to improve customer service. And that is exactly the opportunity it creates for a player like Credix to come into that market. And then um, just kind of piggybacking on that, I would love to get your take on just why why Brazil and why Latin America specifically? Like you're you're obviously from Belgium, right? Uh, you guys could be focusing on you know any other part of the world, but like why why are you deciding to really uh, ramp up and go to market in these markets specifically? It's a very easy answer to that. It's all about the carnival in February in Brazil, right? That's what makes it fun. Um, but but look, all all jokes aside, I I, I would I would love to tell you that this from the beginning was was part of a, a bigger vision, a, a bigger story. But I think we we defined a pain point, and that pain point was that indeed, like in the global south, like you said, there is this underserved market. There is this market that does not have a fair instant embedded access to financial services. And so when we started the Credits platform, our first client was a client in Brazil. And that made us to really understand the market better. And when we start discovering that like the total addressable market for receivables financing alone is $2.4 trillion in Brazil, is $5 trillion in Latin America as a whole, when there are only five banks with a return on equity that is 18%, which is like almost 10 times of what it is in Europe and the US, that made us realize that there is a huge opportunity here. And it was really by focusing on a specific geography, becoming experts in that market, building the local legal infrastructure, integrating with the rights on and off ramps, really customizing the user experience to that market that allowed us to become the best, the biggest, and attract institutional capital at scale. And I'm going to refer here to that debt facility that we just raised. That debt facility that we raised went through the process of a credit fund that wanted to have specifically access to credit in Latin America. They wanted a partner that could originate credits in the Brazilian market, but do that in a scalable way with a diversified portfolio. And you cannot create scale and diversification if you cannot leverage technology. And that is exactly what we're doing at Credix. And that is exactly why we're so excited about Latin America. Now, it's super interesting. And and I remember uh, back when I when I talk, spoke to Maxime last year, I walked away from that conversation feeling like, wow, I feel like these guys, I mean, not to try to like flatter you here, but like, I feel like you guys kind of like hit the nail on the head with something. And it, it's been a bit of a mystery to me as to like, why I feel like there's so many of these types of platforms that have been like trying to do this over the years, like blockchain related and or blockchain based or non blockchain based. Like if you go to, you know, money 2020 conference, at least like half the stands you go to are going to be vendors that say that they're, oh, we're enabling, you know, small business credit facilities in Latin America or something. Right. And it feels like you guys kind of hit the nail on the head with, with both like the actual, like identifying the problem, but and then identifying like a novel technological solution. And then, and then also, you know, just as importantly, having like the right network of you know, being able to kind of solve that chicken and egg problem where you have like both sides of the marketplace um, or you have relationships with both sides of the marketplace to create, to really, you know, to create a buyer and a seller and create, create a market. Right. So, so well done on that. Um, and wanted to just move on here, um, to some other announcements that you guys have been, or some other things that you guys have been up to the last, uh, last year or so. And the first one that, that I found really interesting was there's this tokenized asset coalition, uh, that you guys are one of the founding members of that was announced a few months back. And it's got a few sort of heavy hitter names in it, like your circles and Coinbase and Aave and uh, Credix. So 
uh, would love to just learn more about what that is and what, what are you, you know, sort of looking to achieve by, by being a part of this? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think the, the way that this got started is that over the last, let's say 12 months, there was a lot of hype coming up about RWAs, right? Real world asset tokenization was back into the game, a lot of investing, a lot of companies popping up. Um, and, and every time we were meeting with our, 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 our competitors or our, our friends of the market, we, we started realizing a certain thing. And that is, hey, there is a lot of hype here, but there is still a lot of like blue space to be discovered. There are a lot of lessons to be learned. There is a, a big part of like growing the pie before really focusing on like what is your piece of the pie right there is a lot of work to be done around like regulatory frameworks there is a lot of work to be done around data standardization there is a lot of work that needs to be done around interoperability and so we went to the to the drawing board and we went to sit around the table with a few of those partners indeed like circle and a coinbase that we were already working with and partnering up with on on certain projects and we decided like hey why why don't we get all together we start this coalition we start focusing on those really big problems on the terminology on growing the pie on bringing in the institutions on bringing the education to the market got it got it and how do you see that that progressing, like really sort of advancing this narrative of the RWA narrative? I mean, it feels like once you have a coalition around something, it becomes sort of official, right? But uh, but does this does this have a meaningful way of kind of advancing? Um, I mean, the RWA narrative has kind of just been a weird one to me, uh, just in the sense that like we're, just the very name of it itself is very weird, like real world asset. It's just you know it, you know otherwise known as just like assets, right? Uh, without the real world prefix on it. But how does this, I mean, does this give you or give members of the coalition maybe a bit more uh, kind of uh, a leg to stand on, like in discussions with regulators, for example, or with 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 more TradFi investors who are still sort of trying to, you know, look, get, feel their way around uh, the blockchain world? Or what are, I guess, what are some of the, you know, maybe tangible benefits there? I I think there is this, um, and so I think very particularly we chose the name Tokenized Asset Coalition and not Real World Asset Coalition, <laughs> because indeed we, we, we also wanted to move away from that, uh, from that name. And I think that is really core and key to the, to the ethos of, of this coalition. And that is really like, there is this belief by technology players, investors, startups, financial services, traditional financial services, that the future of the financial services market will be tokenized. What does that mean? Built on a decentralized, scalable, interoperable infrastructure. So we're taking these opaque paper-based assets, these opaque siloed data systems, and we're migrating them to a new technology. And that new technology is a bit scary because that new technology means different kind of business models, means different kind of interactions with these kind of asset classes and that is really the kind of tangible effects that we're trying to create is inviting those institutions to come work together with the technology players to come work together with the startups to learn about the technology to interact with the technology to share their requirements because i think a lot of that can be seen like um, it's not because you tokenize an asset that you don't need to underwrite it anymore that you don't have to take into account risk, that you don't have to understand credit frameworks. And so all of that starts coming together by combining the world of traditional finance, fintech, crypto, and blockchain. And that is really what the coalition is about. And that is really how we're creating direct value add for all the participants in this ecosystem. Got it, got it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh and then moving on here, we'd love to um, just talk through some other partnerships that you guys, some maybe new partnerships you guys have been able to forge in Latin America specifically. Um, you had some recent announcements with like Tecredi, and then there's another there's another fintech called I don't I'm not sure how you pronounce this. It's Clave or Clave or like C L A V E. Um, but just kind of curious as to like other 
other types of uh, fintechs, non-bank lenders that you've been that you've been able to to uh, partner with here uh, in the region? Yeah, um, I, I would love to touch upon our partnership with Clave. Um, so Clave is a fintech platform out of Colombia that is particularly focused on agriculture financing, receivable financing for farmers in the Colombian market. They have built an amazing technology platform. They have built an amazing origination and distribution channel through farmer coalitions, but they needed access to capital to scale up. They had a huge amount of demand, but the local market, the local debt capital markets could not support them in getting access to that financing. And so together with them, we onboarded them on the Credix platform. And by now, we're already uh, providing more than $5 million of financing to the Clave pool of receivables. And we were able together to forge a partnership with Munich Reinsurance, one of the largest insurance companies in the world, a investment grade company to insure those tokenized assets. And so there is a credit insurance directly embedded in the receivables financing here, which makes that we have been able to create a truly institutional product because now pension funds, large hedge funds, large asset managers can get access to this tokenized asset that has an institutional credit quality. Got it. Got it. Now, that's super interesting. And um, moving along here, um, I want to touch just on your fundraising uh, and kind of what your cap table looks like. You guys had a, I believe you had a, a like a, a seed round in maybe it was like November, but basically two years ago. And then you announced an $11 million Series A round in September of last year, uh, which had quite a few big name VCs on it, both from the region and from North America, uh, or North America and South America, I should say. And even had the chairman of Banco Itaú, which is the largest uh, Brazilian bank. Uh, as one of the investors in that round, and would love if love if you could maybe tell us what your fundraising experience has been like. I mean, you've you've been, I guess you've kind of raised in the the, the bull market and in the bear market now, and uh, what kind of that experience has been like? Uh, what the cap table looks like, and what your 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 fundraising uh, roadmap is looking ahead. Definitely. So first of all, we we have very strategically onboarded a diversified set of investors on our cap table. And that indeed includes some unique um, angel investors like the chairman of Itaú, but also, for example, Marcelo Claura, who was at uh, SoftBank before running, running the LATAM fund um, and who now runs uh, the Bicycle Fund, which is a growth equity fund specifically focused on the Latin American markets, doubling down on Brazil as well to capture that opportunity that we were referencing to earlier. Um, and we combine that angel uh, individual experience with um, our crypto native investors like Parify Capital and Cumberland. We have a global fintech investor called Motive Partners who co-led our Series A. And then we have local knowledge. Very important if you're doing these emerging markets, uh, investing and technology building, Valor Capital, um, who braid us brought us great expertise into the local regulatory scene. And a quick side story here, um, two years ago, um, even before they invested, um, they invited me to their crypto conference and I was pitching credits. Um, and this was in Rio de Janeiro. And at the end of my pitch, an, a, a hand in the, the room goes up and it is a person sitting in the front and he's saying, I actually really like this idea and I think the future of debt capital markets in Brazil will be tokenized and I will support you guys in doing that. And I think like, oh, look, uh, this is a very friendly man and, and really nice that he likes what Critics is doing. And after the, after the session, he, he walks up to me and he introduces himself and he's the governor of the Central Bank of Brazil. <laughs> and so we forged a very strong relationship with the Central Bank of Brazil. And over the next few weeks, you will also see a few very interesting announcements from, from our side um, around that partnership and what we're doing uh, together there in the market around the regulatory frameworks. Now, going back to our fundraise, going back to, to how that experience was, um, we raised 
at the end of the bull market, our seed round, uh, which was a very nice experience. Um, a few weeks, we closed a $2.5 million round. Um, um, and then we also raised after Celsius and Three Arrows Capital collapsed and um, the end of crypto seemed very near and blockchain-based investment was not hot at all. Um, but I think throughout that, we always have remained with the same vision and it is like what is our problem statement how are we solving that and how are we doing that with a lean team scaling with technology building the best user experience and doing it institutional great and that has made us successful in being able to attract those uh, big hitters that we have today on the cap table now from a fundraising perspective um we're we're doing we're doing fine at the moment um we we have uh we have a very good runway we're revenue generating uh we're moving towards profitability for um for q3 next year um so our focus is really on product and growing the assets under management on the platform got it got it Amazing. And on, on that last, I love the, the, the anecdote about uh, Roberto Campos Neto. That's amazing. Where you, you, you yes. Just, you, you didn't even realize who he was, but he just raises his hand and walks up to you. Uh, but uh, he, he's been, he's definitely been a, uh, you know, kind of, a, you know, I don't, know, I don't know if cheerleader is the right word, but he's definitely been supportive uh, probably more than any other, you know, G20 central bank governor uh, of this industry in particular and of this technology. So that's, that's a super fun anecdote. Um, I also heard from somebody else that he used to mine Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, I've I've heard that from somebody. Anyway, um, one other uh, going back to your last point about just like just growing the total amount of AUM on the platform, and I'd like to to talk about uh, just the the investors who are not not investors in your company, but the investors who are putting money into the platform. And I believe last time I talked to to Max uh, in our last interview. He was mentioning, I asked him this question, like what types of investors are you guys attracting? And he was mentioning like, you know, kind of the, the first batch uh, was really more kind of crypto native hedge funds and, you know, kind of the folks you'd expect to be first movers in this. And, but they're starting, you know, the interest was starting to pick up in uh, kind of more TradFi uh, funds who are just interested in alternative asset classes and that type of thing. So 15 months later, when you're looking at that, that TradFi investor who has some appetite for, uh, alternative assets, but maybe they're not super gung-ho on blockchain, but they're looking for non-traditional alternative asset opportunities. What has been, you know, what are those conversations like with these types of people that are maybe they're, they're interested in what you guys are doing, but maybe they're not really fully sold on this whole blockchain thing. Um, what are some of like, you know, maybe some of the positive feedback you get? What's, what are maybe some of the, you know, some of the, the questions that you get that or some of the uncertainties that they might have? Yeah, I think look for for us the block the the conversation with an investor could and should never be around like is this on blockchain or not? Why are you guys using smart contracts? It is about the quality of the originations and the assets on the platform and providing a 10x better user experience than the traditional channels that they would use. How do you do that? You do that by creating a digital and data-driven real-time experience, getting real-time insights in your portfolio, being able to settle your transactions at a 10x cheaper cost, having a full portfolio overview up into the granularity of the individual loan to a certain SME or a consumer. Um, and so that is really where we have been focusing on. And so that is also why I think we have been um, very successful with those traditional finance players, because we really went to look like, hey, what is, what is the reason that they're maybe not deploying yet into the Brazilian market or into the Latin American market. And it was really not being able to have a digital channel and infrastructure to do so. And the traditional way was really a very expensive route for them with a lot of intermediaries and with a very, very bad quality of service providers. And so we have packaged all of that into a digital solution. 
And that is in the end what it is. It is a digital solution. And yes, it is built on smart contract technology. And yes, it is built on a decentralized infrastructure. And yes, that is what allows us to integrate data processing with the settlement layer, with automated distributions and do it at uh, 10 times cheaper cost. Um, but that should never be the, the core of the conversation that we're having. Got it, got it. Yeah, I like the way you're framing that where it's really about the quality of the assets and the ability to access those assets rather than you know, just, you know, the shiny new technology under the hood sort of thing. So um, a couple of things, a, a couple of final questions here. I would love to just get your reflections on a couple of things. Just you guys have been in live for two years now, or you started two years ago and um, you've kind of ridden various waves here. Um, but really, I think when I think of, you know, the this whole like real world asset, to you know, tokenized asset movement, uh, you guys are really kind of, beating the drum on this before this became kind of like the hot, like cool narrative that everybody's piling into. And I mean, what's it been like just seeing, you know, seeing all the, you know, for the last like 12 months, seeing all this interest piling into this and, and you're sitting, I mean, it must, must feel a bit validating where it's like, wow, like we're, we're onto something, you know, if all these people are finally seeing it. It, it, it is amazing to see. I, I, I think indeed, like when, when, when everything happened, what happened in, in the world of crypto, I think it was a bit scary for everybody. Um, and, and we remained very key and core to our belief that this is the best technology and the best infrastructure to build the new world of finance, the future of finance on top two. It is the only way to scale it, to democratize it, to make it interoperable, to make it more efficient, to provide access to financing to the underserved. And so see, players coming in, tokenizing funds, tokenizing treasuries, bringing on retail, bringing in other alternative asset classes. Um, that, that just excites us a lot. That is uh, just amazing to see. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, I also wanted to get your, uh, your, your thoughts on the Solana ecosystem. Um, were you guys at, I assume you guys were at Solana Breakpoint uh, last or, or, or a few weeks ago. And there's really just a lot of hype around the Solana ecosystem right now. And, and you guys kind of, you know, you're, you, I think you, you know, you're one of, you kind of rode the Solana wave initially, like two years ago when it hit its all time high. And then it's been a bit of a roller coaster for the Solana ecosystem uh, since then. And now things are, now it's, now it's the hot new thing again. Uh, but what's it been like being a part of that ecosystem and kind of riding that wave? Um, I guess both, both in terms of maybe just the narratives around Solana as well as, as uh, I mean, Solana just seems to have a very sort of robust community and uh, infrastructure as far as like supporting projects or building with the technology and that kind of thing. Um, I would love to get your thoughts on that. And then also, this is a bit of a rhetorical question here, but um, how would you an assess your decision to to build on Solana or at least having, you know, kind of the core processing of the, of the platform uh, on Solana I know you guys have some other integrations with their chains and things, but the core is kind of still on Solana. Uh, how would you assess that decision, you know, two years later, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, some of these Ethereum layer twos that are popping up or some of these other uh, Ethereum virtual machine compatible layer ones that are uh, are still floating around? Like, are you, are you, I assume you're still satisfied with that decision, but if you could reflect on that, that'd be awesome. We're, we're, we're still very satisfied with that, uh, with that decision. Our, our, our core processing layer is on Solana, will remain on Solana. We're continuously building new smart contracts, building new features, integrating um, with other partners that have been built on it. Um, from day one, um, our reason to build on Solana was because we believe that the future of finance should be frictionless, fast, and ultra scalable. And Solana was and is the only blockchain that we felt comfortable with that could do that. And so we started building when it was at $20. We kept on building when it was at $200. We remained building on it when it was back to $8. And we will keep building on it whatever the price does. And that is because we truly believe that for these kind of things, the best technology, the world-class technology wins because they will be able to attract the most developers, the most sophisticated applications and builders. And that is what we have found as well in the Solana ecosystem. And so the whole Solana ecosystem has been amazing to us. 
Um, we have had a, a lot of support from Solana Labs from the beginning um, to be able to support us with the technology, introduction to partners, even like launching new kind of credit products and supporting us with that. And then, of course, the developer community is growing very, very strongly. Um, we love uh, Rust as a coding language. Um, I'm pretty sure Max uh, uh, can, uh, can echo that in our developer team. Um, and so, look, we're, we're, we're super excited about what's next for the community and we're super excited to, to be one of the, the main real world asset builders on top of it. Uh, but we invite many others uh, to do so as well. Very cool. Uh, and then maybe uh, just wrap up question here, but what's, what's in store for the next like 12 months for Credix? So like where if we have this conversation in a year, uh, where do you hope to be? Yes. So for us, it is it is all about growth, um, sustainable growth with positive unit economics. So as we are working in the world of credit, it's all about risk adjusted returns. It's all about originating high quality institutional grade assets on our platform and scaling that up uh, month over month. So I would say a year from now, um, we want to we wanna go over that milestone of $100 million of assets under management. We want to onboard additional uh, institutional asset managers. Um, we're doubling down on Brazil. And so let's make sure that we like keep true to our vision and our mission of providing more fair access and transparent access to financing to that market. So I would say those 10,000 SMEs that we're already financing today should easily become 100,000 by uh, the end of next year. Amazing. Wow. That's, uh, I, I, I admire the ambition and that's, that's super cool. And um, I, mean, I think it's important to remember I and mean, maybe take a step back and just think, you know, just remember that all these SMEs, these are all sort of like real businesses, real people, right? And we're sitting here having us, you know, this discussion about kind of maybe a bit more abstract things, right? But these are all people that um, would otherwise have mm -hmm. a much more difficult time accessing credit, right? Uh, to expand their business, to buy a car, to like pay for college or whatever it might be. And um I know you've been spending a decent amount of time here in Brazil um, with, with Chime, your, who's your, your chief growth officer who's based here, or your co-founder, uh, amongst other things, I assume. And um, just wondering if you have any, are there any like kind of notable like success stories that you've encountered uh, amongst some of these, uh, amongst some of the, the, you know, the partners and the, and the, the borrowers that you're working with that, that really kind of resonate? You're like, wow, like this is why we're doing this because we want, we want to be able to provide this service to these people that, otherwise just wouldn't have access to this type of thing exactly and 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 i love the way that you framed it i think it's very important i think the vision and the mission of satoshi back in the day when he launched bitcoin was to create a fair and accessible way to access finance um and i think what we're doing here is an evolution of that to create a local revolution, right? And that revolution is about the people in the street. It is about the solo entrepreneurs. It is about the ones who are building the businesses, who are trying to create a better way to live for the next generation. Um, and to really understand that pain and those problems and the opportunity on the flip side of the coin, I have indeed been spending a lot of time in Brazil. And every time when I'm in Sao Paulo, I, I try to travel around and I try to, to talk to those business owners, to talk to those SMEs, to talk to the individuals that are, um, that are borrowing um, directly or indirectly throughout our platform. Um, very inspiring was um, a story of, uh, of one of the, the solo entrepreneurs that we have been working with um, that um, by being able to get access to credits, by being able to get access to um, deferred payment terms, she could grow her inventory two times um, and thus has been able to really create a more sustainable, profitable business. Um, she operated one small store um, at the outskirts of Sao Paulo. She was able to open a second store in the center of Sao Paulo. 
getting better unit economics, getting growth, and being able to put food on the table and providing for her uh, family. And so that is really what it's all about. That's why we're doing it. Um, we need to find better ways and more fair ways to give those people access to financing. Um, and today we're doing that to those fintech lending platforms, um, but we're also thinking and building on some very interesting new products that we will launch soonish um, to be able to originate even closer and, and, and more directly with those SMEs. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so to wrap up, I'll, I'll throw it back to you here if you have any final thoughts, last word, and um, how can folks get in touch with you if they, if they want to learn more? Um, yeah, so definitely. Um, so um, I, I think first of all, uh, important recap. Um, I think um, we're super excited about um, blockchain as a financial market infrastructure of the future. Um, I think institutions are coming, but it takes time. It takes a certain view on the asset side of things, on credit, on risk management. Um, it is truly creating a 10x better kind of experience. Um, I would invite everybody to look at Brazil as an interesting case study, a case study for regulation, a case study for innovation, a case study for opportunity, where technology can truly make the difference. Um, and so that is what we are, what we're all about, and that is what we're focused on. Um, and then uh, people can definitely um, reach out to me on uh, on uh, Twitter, uh, t underscore uh, Bonner, or uh, through the Credits page. Um, and um, I invite you all to go to the Credits website, check out uh, our app as well, and uh, give any feedback if so. Amazing, Thomas Bonner. Really appreciate your time here. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, hopefully we can grab a coffee, coffee or a shop next time you're in Brazil. So looking forward to it. Uh, a shop uh, sounds uh, like a very good idea. I'm a, I'm a Belgium guy in the end. I, 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 love, uh, I love a good uh, fresh cold beer. Um, thank you so much for, for having me and, and, and critics on the show. Truly uh, appreciate your time. Uh, truly enjoyed the conversation. Um, thank you very much. Amazing. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll be back soon with another great episode.